Okay, hello everyone. This is Austin at Bates Nursery, and uh, thanks for tuning in to another Bates Botanical Boot Camp here. Uh, what we are talking about today is roses, Roses 101, actually. Um, one of my favorite topics because I love roses. They're they're uh, beautiful. They're probably the most well known flower I think on earth, uh, with the long green canes, the, the thorns that they possess, and then also their big beautiful blooms that sit atop of their foliage. Um, like I said, it's probably the most well known flower there is around. Uh, there's literally movies, uh, you know, about roses. There's books written about roses. Um, I was talking to Tyler earlier. I don't know of any other singular plant that there's actually just books written about. I mean, one topic with roses, there's many, many books written about them. Um, they are iconic, even symbolic. Uh, it's beautiful, beautiful plants with uh, a lot of times lovely smells. And um, another thing is that r rose growers, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've had customers come out here and tell me that their, their grandmother or their grandfather was an excellent rose grower. And it's something that lasts with you forever. A rose grower uh, is is remembered for a long time by, by all sorts of people it's it it's truly a, just a beautiful beautiful flower um and i'm not going to sugarcoat it uh, they're not the easiest plant uh, to to take care of and make look beautiful they're a very easy plant to live but to keep them looking beautiful all the time isn't the easiest but it's probably the most rewarding whenever you do get your roses in full show um blooming beautifully and uh so like i said it's the most work probably with plants but it's also the biggest reward so I've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to try to get through this. We'll maybe uh, keep the questions till the end if we can help it, and I'm going to try to get through this thing. So uh, the first thing I wanted to talk to you all about is um, some different types of roses. Now, there's there's a lot these days, but I'm going to go over kind of three of the main ones that are kind of the old school classics uh, that we still sell here every year. We get a large shipment, usually the first week of April. And what I'm going to be talking about is the hybrid tea roses, the grandiflora roses, and the floribunda roses. So... Let's start with hybrid teas, probably the most popular, um, and especially when it comes to cut flower production. Uh, what you need to know about hybrid teas is that they typically grow large, and they have buds and blooms that are singular atop a single cane. So that's kind of one main difference. You're going to have, generally for the most part, a cane with a single beautiful, big, typically bigger bloom atop of, of that. So you just have one bloom per cane. So really good for cut flowers to bring inside and have in a vase for a long time. They're kind of the best for that. Um, they, Like I said, I mentioned they get big. They can get six foot or better, even more if you don't prune. And uh, they, they're just a big bushy specimen. A lot of hybrid teas out there, generally uh, their petal count is pretty high. They've got a large bloom, so they've got a lot of petals in there. Um, that's the first one. Second one we're going to talk about is called Grandifloras. And Grandiflora typically means grand, which is big, and then flora, the flower. So they have big flowers. A lot of times they will have blooms on a single stem as well but not, not always the case sometimes grandiflores can have a couple multiple buds or blooms on the same cane now they are large flowered um, plants and their plants in general are very large in stature as well so uh, similar to a hybrid tea in that way but like i said sometimes you can have more flowers born on a single stem rather than hybrid teas uh, still get pretty much just as large not quite as many grandiflores out there as there are hybrid teas and then last but not least is the floribundas. Uh, these generally stay a little bit smaller in habit. The actual plant doesn't get quite as large. They're bushy in habit. And hence the name floribunda, there's floras, flowers in abundance. So all of these will have single stems that have multiple blooms on the exact same cane. So you really get a very, very showy plant um, as, as a whole, rather than just seeing single stems like the other ones I just mentioned, um, holding up bigger blooms. A lot of times these blooms on the flower bundles are a little bit smaller, but they possess a lot more of them. So it creates a very showy, showy plant. So those are the three, the big ones. Uh, there's also climbers out there. Um, as you probably know, the climbers get very large, and they can. They're more, uh, you know, they go way up. They climb. So they, they can get very large, depending on how you prune. That's another one. And then also, we can talk about the shrub roses, which have become extremely popular now. Uh, we sell uh, drift roses out here. Um, they even have a, another brand is like Flower Carpet. And then there's obviously the knockouts. You probably are very familiar with knockout roses. They're used extensively. Uh, they bloom beautifully, and they get huge quickly. They take a prune really easy. It's a very easy rose to grow. Not necessarily 
my favorite, I think, because I like the challenge and I want to see, um, uh, I want to put in the work to get the reward. So the knockouts have, I don't want to say ruined the Rose world, but to an extent they have because they perform so well. They get so big so quick and they almost constantly bloom that uh, people get spoiled with roses when you use a knockout. So uh, like I said, knockouts are probably our most popular rose that we sell because because of their ease. But to me, it's just not what I want in a rose. I, I want a little bit of a challenge, and I want some color, and I want you know just some some differences. So, uh, those are some of the roses that we sell out here. But like I said, I'm gonna steer. I'm gonna stick to more of those those three that I talked about um, originally. Okay, so now let's uh, move on to actually how to grow roses. <clears throat> um, first thing I wanted to mention to y'all that I think is 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 a good thing to do is that most rosarians, people that actually grow roses, they grow their roses together in a sp- specific spot in the yard or in their garden not necessarily with other landscape plants like at the front of your home like with your design a lot of times roses aren't used that way you almost designate a specific spot in the garden to grow your roses Um, the reason I say that is because roses aren't always the cleanest plant on earth what I mean by that is that they're very very hardy plants for the most part you're not going to kill a rose all that much but for them to look just perfect throughout the whole season usually is not the case. So putting them right up front in your home, a lot of times, not all all the time, they're going to look great. So using them in their own specific area, get them where they're all together. And then whenever they are in show and they're blooming together, you get a beautiful just scene of them all together rather than like individuals kind of placed somewhere. So if I could recommend anything to you right off the bat is to, is to create your own rose haven, if you will, and just designate an area specifically for roses. Um, this also helps out with whenever you do have to say spray or you have an insect pest or a pathogen or anything like that, all of your roses are kind of together. So it makes the ease of that and the pruning as well, a little bit easier on you to keep them all just, uh, kind of together. Um, so let's talk about what roses want. First off, they need a full sun environment, six or more hours of sunlight every day, if possible. Um, they really bloom best in the in that amount of sunshine. So if you have a shady spot, try not probably not roses is, is, is going to be the way for you to go. So good full sun. Uh, second step is we want a well drained soil if you can help it. Uh, Middle Tennessee specifically is not always known for that. Uh, We have some somewhat heavy clay soils here, some worse than others. But if you can help it, get them in a well-drained area as much as you can. Roses, are they do like a fair amount of water, um, but they don't want to just be sitting in water all the time either in an environment where there's nothing draining. So um, try to avoid that as well. And then um, another thing we need to talk about is, is... how heavy roses feed that they're they really use a lot of of um, fertilizer in the early spring um, to help them and keep them looking good year after year pretty much we're going to fertilize these guys in the early spring so whenever they're actively growing this is general rule of thumb with pretty much every plant but roses are no different whenever they first start leafing out in the spring is when we want to get a fertilizer down around the base of the soil and worked in the first couple inches um, to make sure that we're keeping these guys fed because they really do use a lot of of, of food. Um, I brought a little product in here today to show you. Nothing special. This is an organic product just called Rose Tone. It's a simple fertilizer, like I said, that is organic. And you're going to sprinkle this around the top bit of your soil, work it in the top couple inches, and do that at least usually about two to three times in the early spring. Once dead of the summer really starts to come around and it's crazy hot and not very fun to be outside, that's about the time we really don't need to fertilize too much more. But in the early spring, doing it two or three times really gives them a boost and gives them what they want to keep on to keep on blooming. Um, <clears throat> so after that, when it comes to growing roses, you um, we need to talk about a couple of things. What I had mentioned earlier is roses are very hardy plants. Trust me, they are. But to keep them clean throughout the year is it's hard work, and it, it, it takes a lot of effort. Now, if you aren't necessarily out in the garden all the time, and you 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 know that's not something that you like to do all that much, and you um, uh, want to grow you know roses but you don't want to put in all that effort, then what you're going to have to live with is a little bit of imperfection. Um, There's certain things I'm about to talk about that make roses look a little rough. Uh, It's not like they're dead or anything, but they can have some leaf drop. They can have some black spot on the leaves. Uh, They can have insect-related damages. And 
if you're not willing to get out there and work with them, you're going to see that. Now, they're not going to kill the plant, but it is going to make it unsightly. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, a little bug called, uh, it's actually the larvae of a sawfly. So a sawfly is a very tiny little winged insect that lays eggs. And when those eggs hatch, out come little worms. Now, a common name is just what we would call rose slugs is a common one. It is almost definitely going to get on your roses at some point. They are very host specific. So what I mean by that is that they don't really get on many other plants besides roses. They specifically want to attack roses. That's their main food source. So you are going to see that. What you're going to see is usually the damage before you ever actually see the worm. The worms are small. They're almost clear, but they've got a greenish tint to them, and they blend into that leaf really well. And they're also on the backsides of that leaf. They don't just sit right on top and make it easy for you. So what happens a lot of times is that you'll come out one day and you'll see your rose and say, oh, no, there's holes all in it, and there's little, you know, um, it's kind of hard to explain the damage, but it's almost like a whitish, they, they eat the, the foliage so it's like this whitish, and then after they eat enough of it, it creates holes. So you'll see holes throughout your whole plant. You'll say, oh, no, what's happened? Well, you've got a sawfly larvae um, infestation. You turn, go to the leaves on some of them, and look on the backside of that leaf, you'll almost for sure see worms. That's the biggest insect pest that gets on roses by far. So... Um, how to control or prevent. So prevention is the best way to keep your roses clean. And to prevent, you have to use chemical sprays. I brought one in here that is called Captain Jack's uh, Dead Bug. The active ingredient in this is called spinosad. It works really well. It's a good insecticide really across the board, but it specifically works well with um, worms so or, or caterpillars. So if you are on the ball about your roses and you want to keep them things clean, uh, you need to start on a spray regimen early in the spring so whenever the leaf so wait for the leaves to fully kind of emerge and get as full size as they're going to be and then you can start your spray regimen this actually is taken into the plant and it's it, once the insect feeds on it it dies so you can get this going early in the spring and try to so those the sawfly has multiple generations through a season usually two but a lot of times it can be three different generations that'll attack the roses so to prevent that you want to start on a spray regimen about i don't know once every you know, about three weeks to go out and get a spray on these to on the the roses to keep them clean do know this product kills bees so i really recommend if your rose is in full bloom Try to avoid spraying your plant because that will kill your bees or at least do your best to avoid spraying those blooms specifically. So we don't want to kill the bees or any beneficial insect for that matter. So do your best to kind of help out with that because this is not an organic product, uh, but it is very effective on keeping your rows clean. Now, if you didn't want to go with something that's non-organic, you can go with this product here. This is called BT. You've probably heard of this. It's good at killing worms as well. Uh, this is an, an organic product, so it's not going to hurt anything, and it will um, kill those nasty little worms that are on there as well. So um, you have to kind of do this a little bit more. It's not quite as stout as the first product I showed you. So getting a good you know getting on a good regimen of doing this every two to three weeks is really going to help you out with prevention now if you missed out on the prevention and uh an infestation has happened and you see it and you know they're on there um then there's other routes we can take if you want now obviously you can still spray these chemicals on to that plant after you see the the damage and it will kill the worms that are on there but Damage is damage. Once it's done, it's done. So you're going to have those holes regardless with whether you spray or not. Yeah, you'll kill the worms, but you're still going to see that damage. So one thing I wanted to talk to you about, so I'm going to get in more depth here in a minute, is the use of these whenever you have an insect problem. These are just simple pruners. What I mean by this is pruning out damage. Um, I prune my roses a lot throughout the season. I'm not a big spray guy. I'm not never been a fan of it. I don't like to hurt bees either. So I kind of I'm, I, now I look at my plants a lot. That's another thing we need to talk about. You need to look at your roses a fair amount, in, in, especially in the, the growing season, just to make sure you're not getting behind and something is is attacking or something's going on. So pruning out damage though is something that I really recommend. Now. And it's, say your damage is up, is up top mainly of the plant and you see all these holes and everything and it just looks terrible. Going in in the middle of the season and pruning back your roses is a fine method to do because roses specifically have a very quick response time after you cut them. Once you cut them, they really say, okay, I need to grow again. And they usually do very quickly. Within a couple weeks, you'll have new leaves that are out there and looking good once again, pretty much full size. 
Um, but what I'd mentioned earlier is that you have to be okay with a little bit of imperfection. There is a two week period there where you may look at your roses or someone come over and look at them and be like, why your rose dead? There's no leaves on it. Well, it's because we simply had to prune out the damage. That'll get rid of eggs, insects, and even pathogens if you have them. And then we'll get new leaf emergence and we can more or less start over. But like I said, don't expect perfection with roses um, if unless you're going to p- put in the work. But there is a couple two week period where you just kind of have to wait around for them to get back big and, and leafy and then they'll rebloom for you. So using pruners to, to, to get rid of insect damage is really something that I recommend as well without having to use chemicals. Okay, so that's the biggest insect. Don't get me wrong, y'all. There's a lot more insects that get on roses. Those are That one's just the biggest one that almost occurs every single year. Um, but aphids are small-bodied, soft-bodied insects that are common on all plants, really. But they like roses as well, and they'll get on the buds uh, specifically, usually, and you'll see them. If you see that, you can literally just rub off aphids if you want. You can spray them with soaps or oils. Uh, that's another organic method that, that kills aphids pretty easily. They're not all that hard to kill, but you don't want those numbers to get up too high. So, uh, the number of pests, though, get on roses. So keep your eye out and make sure you just watch them. Do a little scouting every once in a while is what we call. Just go out and look at them. Walk around the rose bed. See how they're doing throughout the season. Observance is really, truly the, 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 the first key. We have a quick question. Uh, <coughs> Laureen uh, is asking, any tips for training climbing roses? Well, you have to figure out a way. Uh, to get them up on something. So whatever you have, if you have a trellis, if it's the side of your home, um, climbers don't necessarily, they will once they get big enough, but they don't necessarily climb right off the bat. So you kind of have to pin them to it. Now, you can do that with uh, twist ties, bread ties, um, really anything you got that can kind of work. We sell all sorts of stuff here that's just like twine with like rubber kind of around it that's really flexible and, and, and nice and soft on your plants. Yeah, it and doesn't we sell damage them in anything. rolls. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt the plants at all. I use that for a lot of, a lot of stuff. So um, really, you don't have to think about it too much. Avoid like slick wire um, like you would use for fencing or something like that. Like we don't want like anything cutting into the stems and, and girdling them is what we call it. So avoid that. But there's really no special way to do it. Just make sure you get them up and off the ground. And um, if they have a structure above them that's kind of woven, then a lot of times you can almost just train those canes within that to get them going up and uh, and they'll they'll keep climbing for you. So like I said, just find something soft and nothing too too hard that's going to girdle those stems, and you, and you, and you can use it. Uh, Andy, we'll see if we can get Anora to put a link in there to the uh, the soft twine. Um, I think it's one of the major brands, though. That it is, yeah. I can't remember what brand yeah. it is either, but it, let me it, see it, if I can dive in. Yeah, it's good. All right, so yeah, the insect stuff. Yeah, get ready for insects, y'all. It's going to happen on the roses. Just, just be aware and uh, and watch out for it. Next thing is uh, potential pathogens. So we're going to talk about two, but I guess one extremely specifically, and this is common, and you will see it in Middle Tennessee. Every single year. Um, I hate to say it, but it is something that happens even on the most disease-resistant roses out there. And it's the thing that is called black spot. Now, this is just a uh, leaf spot pathogen. It's a fungus that gets on roses, pretty much specifically roses. And hence the name black spot. It has little black spots all over the leaf. Another thing that you will notice when you have a black spot problem is it mainly starts from the bottom of the plant or the interior of the plant where the least amount of airflow is. Uh, It will jump to the outsides of the leaves, don't get me wrong, once the middle starts to get going, uh, but you'll see it in the interior of the plant first. Um, Also, what you're going to see if you have black spot is a little bit of yellowing on the leaf, and then it's quick to drop off. It's kind of, it's an odd thing, but it's like you can literally take your finger and just barely touch a leaf that has black spot on it and it'll drop right off to the ground that's another way you can know if you've got it but it's pretty simple to know that you've got black spot because it is just the name they have black spots on them Uh, this typically happens from rain in the early spring once it starts to warm up and fungus is more active and the rain will splash down on the dirt down below it it will kick up some of those spores those fungal spores usually from last year and it will get on the leaves and that's how it starts Um, Once again, if you want to be more organic and not have to be spraying all that much, pruning out that damage is a good practice to do. Once again, you have to wait for a leaf, um, you know, for leaf emergence after that, but it's about a two week period where you got to wait. But usually once the new leaves start to emerge, they come out clean. 
Now, once they do come back out clean, if you want to keep them clean and you're tired of dealing with the black spots, say you deal with it every year and it's really annoying, then we need to get on a fungicide regimen. Now, I brought in a product here I'll show you that is called Funganil. Uh, the active ingredient in this is chlorothalonil, and it is a pretty broad spectrum fungicide that works for most things. Now, doing this early and keeping on it is going to be your best bet on keeping your roses clean so you never want to have to cut them you don't want to wait for that time period for them to come back and you want them pretty from start to finish first off that rarely happens but it is possible but you've almost have to do a fungicide regimen within i mean literally like either every week or every two weeks getting a fungicide coated on those leaves to keep that black spot from happening this will also help against other common um, diseases that roses can get uh, powdery mildew is a common one that's uh, a white substance that can be rubbed off of the leaf but it's kind of this this white uh stuff like all over the kind of the leaves you've probably seen it before uh, but this will take care of that as well which is pretty common on roses so keeping your roses clean through the season this a fungicide is a must in middle tennessee it is you're not going to see a rose without black spot in our state um hardly ever and without the use of this so Keeping a, a rose clean through the season, fungicides are going to have to be used. If you don't want to use fungicide, you're going to have to deal with some black spots, some lower leaf drop, and um, a way you can help out with that with your pruning as well, which I'm going to teach you how to prune one here in a second, but um, keeping the interior open as much as possible. So that goes with a lot of plants, but the, all the airflow on the interior of the plant is really crucial. So taking out stems that are in the center, very vertical, or in the middle of the plant, um, is beneficial and then only keeping those canes that are going at an outward vase shape look so i'll show you what i mean by that in just a second um so uh, yeah real Black quick and another question uh, from dawn hmm? how well do climbing roses do in pots they can do fine but they get large so the more plant you have up top the more root mass you're going to need down below so if you're a climbing rose you know say your climbing rose has never been pruned and you've had it for 10 years in a pot um, and it's gotten 20 foot tall which they can um, you're probably going to have to repot that but i was going to mention that growing roses in pots in our state is actually much easier than it is in the ground you can control what's going on down below and you keep a lot less uh, natural you know fungus in living in the ground and all that you don't have that near as much so containerizing your roses is really a good thing to do and also you can get fertilizer down into that root zone a little bit easier than you can in the ground so i really recommend growing roses in, in containers and i think it's beautiful i think i don't think it's done enough um so yeah, it can be done, but just know that as the plant grows bigger, you're probably going to need to repot that every few years. Uh, you don't necessarily have to put it in a bigger container every year. You can just take it out of the container it's in, maybe cut off a third or half of the roots just to get it less, you know, some of that root mass removed, prune the top canes down a little bit, and then repot it back into that same pot and it'll grow just fine. But just use a well-drained mix. And yeah, grow grow roses in containers. But climbers are a little bit trickier just because you are going to have to prune them to control that size just a little bit. Uh, June's at <clears throat> excuse me. June is asking, <coughs> will fruit tree spray fungicides work? Yes, typically a lot of the fungicides are pretty general. Uh, you look on your label, but it should mention black spot on it. The problem with the fruit tree mark with it marketing to a fruit tree, fruit trees don't necessarily have like black spot like a rose would, uh, but it has a lot of similarities. So I'd have to see the active ingredient, but I'm sure it would. It, most of the fungicides are a pretty broad spectrum, so you should be fine to do that. All right, so that's black spot. Uh, one really terrible disease that I need to mention that really mainly happens with knockout roses just because we've created a monoculture with knockout roses. They're so easy that most everybody goes to them first. So they're planted in a lot of areas like in, in subdivisions and they're planted close together. Um, what you see is a problem called rose rosette. Now, rose rosette's a bad one because it pretty much creates a non-blooming plant has really not it's categorized by really like the stems that'll come up and they'll make these buds and they'll form buds but they'll be really the word is gnarly they look really gnarly like they just shouldn't look like that they're all kind of 
crinkled up on a stem and you'll see it big chunks throughout the whole plant. You've probably seen this before um, or even had this issue. Um, it is a virus and in the plant world, viruses do not come back from that. So there is no cure for a virus. There is no magic spray that's going to get rid of it. Now, how the virus happens is actually from an insect, a mite actually, a very tiny little mite you probably never even see. And they are a vector of the virus. What that means is that they can transfer that. There's a number of insects that transfer viruses to other plants but this is one of them that's specific to roses so if you have insect problems which the mites are kind of tricky because you really don't see them they're really small so if that happens if you're not on a spray regimen and keeping the insecticides on your roses and one of these mites comes in and starts to eat on your rose then you and they have that virus they're carrying that virus then it's going to get into that tissue of the plant and unfortunately you're going to see a rose that looks awful and it's going to generally decline as the years go on and certainly lead to death at the at, you know at some point they'll hold on for a while but they eventually will die um, and another common question we get all the time is well i don't want to put a rose back in the same spot um, which is fine if you don't want to but if you love roses and you want to go back in with roses then you can simply easily do that the mite is airborne so it's going to be you know they're crawling around they're in the air there's nothing to do with the soil it is not a soil-borne pathogen at all it's only transferred by an insect so if you have rose rosette and you pull that rose up and get rid of it and you want a new one that is totally fine to do is nothing infecting your soil or anything it's based on an insect now i'm not saying that insect can't come back and do it again because um, it certainly can happen but if you want to go back with roses, it's totally fine to do that. So, yes, rose rosette. It's not a fun one. Not a good one. All right. So, that's growing them. And some common pests and pathogens, which I say common because it is real that you're going to see it. So, next step is let's talk about pruning. Um, we need to talk a little bit. We need to talk about dormant pruning versus in-season pruning. So, like I had mentioned earlier, I prune my roses a lot during the season. You have to deadhead a lot. Y'all probably know what deadheading means, but I'll go over it. And that's just simply after the bloom has faded and it is done, going in and cutting it back to remove those old blooms. The cleaner you can be with your roses, the cleaner your roses are going to be as well. Anytime you see leaf drop, litter the bottom down below your rose, or you see old petals and blooms and they drop off onto the ground beneath your rose, that's going to be a spot where fungus can actively grow on top of those. And that's where transfer happens. And so the cleaner you can be by pruning your roses, deadheading those old blooms, getting them, getting them taken care of, getting rid of interior leaf drop if you see any of that, and cleaning up down by the base of the plant is going to be your first step um, with that. So that's just simple pruning in in you know during the season and just keeping up with them every you know two or three to four weeks going out there and cleaning them up and keeping them tidy you can do that like i had mentioned earlier you can literally defoliate a rose if you had to tell you i had a rose that was up this big i can go in and say it has tons of leaves on it looking great i could literally go in there and take it and cut it back in half cut off all the leaves all the blooms everything Within two weeks, you're going to see new leaf emergence from buds that are down below on those canes, and you're going to see a plant that gets right back up. So if you have to do some of that, don't be scared to prune your roses during the season. They will respond just fine. So the next thing is um, pruning when they're dormant. I do recommend this over the winter time is what I mean. Dormancy just means they don't have leaves and it's usually cold. So getting out there January, February, anytime before spring leaf emergence is uh, going to be helpful for you. This just helps out getting rid of old um, dead or diseased wood, canes that are non-productive or getting too big or getting just gnarly or ugly and getting your canes back down to a um, similar size all the way atop the whole plant. Um, I actually brought a rose in today to hopefully try to prune for y'all. Uh, and this one is still dormant. Let me try to get it to where y'all can see it good. Is that okay, Tyler? More towards me? Yeah. Uh, before we begin the pruning demo, a sure. couple questions What's related up? to just the previous topic. Uh, Dawn's asking, when should we start the regiment with fungicide? You're going to want to start that. It depends on our weather, but for the most part, roses are going to be leafing out by April. Um, 
<laughs> even a little bit before. But what I was talking about earlier is just let those leaves mature first is really just let them get to their normal size. Um, typically, like I said, uh, first uh, first of April, you know, first little bit of April, mid-April, you want to go ahead and start on that because once late April and May starts coming around, we start to see fung- fungus activity and uh, you need to get that going. So as long as they're leafed out fully, that's whenever you can start that regimen. And Teresa on Facebook is asking, is it rose rosette that makes uh, the plant woody with tiny leaves? Yes, uh huh. It's categorized by that as well. Um, it's more well known probably for the blooms because the uh, uh, the blooms look so gnarly, or the buds do anyway. But yes, like those little weird looking leaves. I can categorize it mainly by just it looks weird. It looks gnarly. It looks messed up. That's kind of the biggest way. So yeah, what you're seeing those small leaves and small buds and wickedness kind of, if you will, that's definitely a clear sign of rose rosette. Usually, there's not in many other pathogens that really resemble it. It's very specific. And then maybe you can tackle this during your pruning demo, but Andy's asking, uh, do you have any tips for cleaning up at the base of the plant without stabbing your fingers? <laughs> well, use gloves anytime you, you're working with roses for sure. Uh, but you know what I've used that I really like is a uh, leaf blower. I just get out there and just take my leaf blower real low and just blow all that stuff away. That's been the quickest, most easiest way to do it for me. Other than that, just a good old-fashioned rake. Uh, y'all know how it is. Landscaping and gardening is not easy work. It's work. So um, it's one of those things It's just kind of Sometimes the best method is get on the hands and knees and just work and just pull that back and, and get remove it as, as quickly as you can. Is it true that there are chain mail gloves that... Uh, For rose growers? Yeah. Probably. That prevent the... Yeah. Oh, I'm sure of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's definitely rose gloves I've heard of out there, like mm-hmm. rosarians have and people that work with them every day. Mm. And I'm sure they're stronger than most because, yeah, roses will get you. Roses are... They ain't no joke. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, wear your gloves, y'all, for sure. Uh, Wendy's asking, are you just popping off where the bud is or cutting back to where that stem ends? And this is a good probably time to transition into that demo. If you yeah, want we're going to gonna transition to that. And yes, you are going to you are going to focus on specific buds. I'm going to show you that. So the first things first, though, on a rose. Is this a good spot? I got to see it just. I mean, so y'all can. We good? This way? In yeah. front of my face? I mean, we're, <laughs> we're good. Just uh, to where you can display where you're pruning okay. closest to the camera so I can zoom in on it. All right. All right. So first things first with any plant for the most part is to get rid of any diseased or dying wood. So we want to start with, see, this little guy in here, this little guy. See it? how it just broke off? That's how you know it's not productive it's not needed it was on the interior of the plant that happens a lot get rid of that just a little stick we don't need this is just minimal pruning right off the bat so this little stick's going towards the interior if y'all can see that it's really non-productive it's small let's go ahead and take it all the way back to the main uh, core of the plant if you will i'm going to talk about other where we're going to cut otherwise but let's just get rid of the stuff that we don't want first Um, this little guy right in here is in between two stems that are very productive uh, it's in between them, causing less airflow in there. Uh, right here, can y'all see? It's kind of hard to see. But it's just another little yeah, stem can. that's in between two canes. So let's go ahead and remove the whole cane all the way back to the main stem there. Um, I've got, what I do want to is a nice interior, which I had mentioned earlier. So stems that are in the middle that are not, they're just going to be more issues if you leave them. Uh, let's go ahead and get rid of those. So I see this stem here. It's very dead center of the plant. It is going out to an angle that we would want, but what I'm seeing in here is what looks like potential leftover insect activity that was on it in the middle of this cane, and it just doesn't look very good to me. It doesn't look very healthy. And how... How how does it how does the insect activity strike you? Like is there well, any telltale? Well, it's all different. I mean, uh, it depends on the insect, but it just looks like something has been on this stem at some point during its life, and it's causing it to weaken it. Uh, it's still a productive cane. It still would produce leaves and flowers, but being clean with roses, like I had mentioned earlier, is something that we really want to try to achieve. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. You know, this time of the season, instead of having to worry about it down the road. So. That cane right there, I'm just going to take all the way down to the main stem again. So this is a pretty large cane, but it's also getting interfering with this one over here that I like. So let's go ahead and remove that all the way down. Would you say a good rule of thumb is like if it's crossing over the center stem of the plant to the other side, be good to remove that? Yeah, 
Generally, really any crossing. Uh, I should have mentioned that earlier. It's a, crossing in the plant world is typically not a bad, th- I mean, not a good thing. What you get is rubbing, and when you that rubs too much, you in, you create more of an entrance, an entryway for something. So we want to avoid the crossing of stems. That's why I bring to mention this cane right here. This is a really nice, productive green cane. It's very thick and sturdy. But what I don't like about it is that it's crossing with my cane that I like going at this vase shape that I want to achieve. This is going va- way more vertical. So Try and rotate that around a little bit. Uh, yeah. See it there? See these two? How I'm pulling them apart, and they cross, they're crossing, and they're about to touch each other. And this is the cane right here that's going out at that angle that I kind of want to keep. So I don't really like this stem. What I could do is take this one instead and let that go because it is highly productive. But I'm going to shorten these anyway. Actually, that may be a good idea because that's not – that is such a nice cane. This one's getting a little older. Let's just start. So we're going to – I'm going to – you know, don't take off too much right off the bat. Kind of, you know, slowly do it and make your cuts. But I can get rid of this one that's crossing just to get rid of the cross. And – Another thing I can do that I need to show y'all, if I can show you this now so y'all just know, we want to prune roses always, to, when, when you're getting specific, to an outward-facing bud. Any bud, that this bud's right here, can you see it? Move over, move over to the mic. Oh, um, an outward-facing bud. So this cane right here, which is a pretty good cane, has a bud right there that is going towards the interior of this plant. That's the opposite of what we want. We want it going towards the outer edge of that. So whenever I'm shortening and I'm cutting buds, you are going to find the bud you want to keep, which is this one here that's going at an outward angle. It's wanting to go out. And you want to cut just above that to leave a little bit of that stick above it and then have that be your bud that you want to keep that's going out that way. So that's what we're going to start doing on all of these is to, to you know start cutting to keep those buds, forcing them out. So like this cane here that's rubbing that I wanted to cross, I got a bud that's coming right here that's wanting to go that way. It's what we want, so let's cut right above that, and that's going to be the bud that's we're, that we're going to keep. This little stem that's right in here is not really, it's too much going on. Let's just take that whole thing. A little stick over here. It's not great. I've got a good cane. Good start to a cane right over here that's got two buds, actually, that are coming towards me, uh, which is still outward facing, which is what we want. And I want to shorten this a little bit. Oh, look, I got a really bad bud right here. That's a good cane, good healthy green cane. I've got a bud right here going this way towards that interior. Not what we want, but the bud below it right here, little bitty red bud, is going out this way. So let's just go ahead and shorten that, get rid of the bud that's going in, and we'll keep the bud that's going out. So that's what we want right there. This is another one right next to it. This bud right here going towards this one. Not where we want to be, but the next bud below it is right here, and that's going at an outward facing angle. Let's go ahead and take that right above that and let that go that way. So we're getting pretty good. I'm a little tall. I don't, I don't like to keep my roses this tall. I don't know if y'all have noticed. You probably have. But if you go to, like, Tractor Supply right now or, like, uh, Lowe's or whatever, they have, you know, roses in little bags that have, you know, their little pot. is mainly uh, sawdust usually is what they use. And they'll have about three to four little green canes coming out of that pot, only about this tall. That lets you know, like, you can really prune roses pretty heavily, and you're probably not going to hurt anything. So uh, they're sold that way all the time. They're just cut back heavily. So you can shorten this thing a pretty good amount. Um, but I'm going to go to this level, I think, where I already have my buds that I like. So uh, we're going to do it that way. And I'm going to find a bud over here that's going towards an outward-facing angle, and we're going to shorten to a similar size to all these. So, I'm going to do the same thing over here on this chunky bud over here. And I got a, one going out right there. Let's get that one. Got to shorten this one down to size. This one's going real vertical. Not my favorite, but I've got a good bud right here. It's trying to come this way. So, we'll just leave it for now. You can prune it later if you ever had to. Still don't really like this stem. About how much growth do you expect that rose to put out in the coming season? Oh, a bunch. I mean, it'll get right back to the same size it was the year before, if not bigger, um, usually. But it depends on which rose we're talking about. If you know, but this one here is called Party Hardy. Uh, hence the name. It's a mm-hmm. very hardy, hardy rose. Yeah, it's very tough. I've had this. I can tell we've had this a while, and it's still plenty fine, and it's in its container. So, but yeah, you'll see a rapid regrowth. 
And speaking of varieties, you've got some visual aid to show us. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show you some. Uh, yeah, some varieties at the end. There's some of my personal favorites, and/or just uh, you know favorites for rose growers all over. And I, I got a good book here to show you on that. But let's finish up pruning this rose. I'm going to take this cane. It's bugging me too much. Just get it out. Open up the interior. This stem right here is wanting to go a little bit vertical. I don't have a great little bud over here, but I got something started. You know, small stems do grow into big canes, so um, don't be scared to cut or or leave some stuff that's small uh, because that actually will. Y'all can see that, like this right here, because I'm gonna take this. Oops. I'm gonna take this whole stem, take it back all the way. All right, so I've got some sticks that are pretty uniform at the moment. I've got a big one I need to address. This one over here, I've got a good bud right here that's going in a good direction out i need to find one over here which i did take that because i've got a bud on the underneath side that's coming out this way so the roses are still dormant right now mostly right yeah. um is now i guess now is a good time to prune still it's getting to the point where i think if you live in the city for the most part i think your roses have started to already want to leaf out early mm. i mean um some of ours on the lot have already tried to leaf out, I've noticed. So some are earlier than others. But I'd bet if you live in warmer area or they're in a protected site, you've probably already seen some leaf emergence out there. So um, it's technically you've probably gotten a little bit late now. But like I said, don't worry about it. You can prune a rose in the middle of the season if you have to. So uh, they're very, very good at bouncing back. This big stem here is going right atop this cane right here. And I'm not really thrilled with that hope my pruners can cut this but i'm just going to take this whole big limb out of there <clears throat> and i'd make a better cut i wasn't planning on making that big of a cut but go ahead and do that and now we're left with a rose that is at a good shape everything going outwards and buds where we want them going at an outward facing this is a little bit long take that in there and I'll leave that one. So, yeah, that's not bad. You got multiple canes, multiple buds within this cane, taking them down uniform, all the same size, so they leaf out all at the same size. Um, so, not that hard to do. It's just a few things, you know, that you kind of need to know. Um, you know, first, dead and, desi dead and diseased wood, get out first. That's the whole first thing you need, need to do. Clear out that interior, keep the buds going outward um, and to keep this interior clean. Uh, Ingrid's asking, my climbing Eden roses kept most of their leaves this winter. I had some black spot and some insect damage last season. Should I pull all the leaves off now? Are they, if they're old leaves, then probably, yeah, I would recommend that, especially if you're, they're still showing signs of having those issues. I would say get rid of them. It's weird, but it's not crazy for a rose to keep its leaves through the whole wintertime. If it's in a very protected spot and it's, we've had a fairly warm, minus our cold snap we had a couple weeks ago, um, it's been fairly warm. So yeah, a lot of roses, even knockouts too, can keep their, keep their leaves. It's fairly rare, but they can keep their leaves through the whole winter. If they are though, still presenting those issues, you're going to see issues again this year if you don't you know kind of clean those back up and get rid of that stuff and then get it out of there get it away from the bottom of the plant uh, and you should have a little bit better success uh, Don's asking how about moving roses is it a good time to move a rose right now yeah you could probably do it now it'd be fine I mean I generally recommend you do it when it was just true dormant over the winter um, we're starting to get into spring now they're starting to get kind of juiced up but if you are going to do it go ahead and do it now try to get as much of that root system as you can uh, they have a pretty hefty root system down below so digging a nice wide hole and getting down pretty deep to get as much of that root mass as you can have your other hole already ready so you can take that plant and transplant it very quickly to the next spot cover it back up with soil and water it in really well and make sure it's packed in there you know nice and tight in the ground and you should have fine success roses are very very uh, resilient plants and june's asking use sealer or will it scale over itself it seals over itself i've never had an issue with it we prune roses out here on the nursery especially constantly to keep them clean and looking good for all y'all and i've never used a sealer ever and had hardly any issues with that so uh, just straight cuts will be fine if you're going from multiple roses to you know if you have a whole bunch of different varieties may be a good idea to have some alcohol with you to uh, sterilize your um your pruners in between different shrubs just in case you are passing on anything that may be bad uh, it's not bad practice to, to do that ever 
Uh, and uh, Teresa has got a question. Is there a companion plant that can be planted in a container to help with the health of a rose? Gosh, help with the health of it? Not, not that I know of, no. I mean, um, the sawfly larvae is is aggressive, to say the least. And I, I there might be, <laughs> but honestly, I've never heard of that uh, to deter the insect pest anyway. And the black spot, no, there's no other. It's not black spot's going to specifically get on your rose. Uh, there's nothing I know of that's that's a natural deterrent of of that fungus anyway. Um, I picked up on sawfly larvae. Terry in her composting webinar at the beginning of this week said, actually, sawfly larvae are really great. Uh, snack sources for chickens oh yeah so maybe letting your chickens <laughs> peck all over your roses uh might get you somewhere maybe <laughs> but okay where are we at so yeah show and tell show and tell some cool varieties or point and see or all whatever right. cool so there's your rose all opened up looking good ready to go for the spring all right get rid of these You know, guys, you can root roses, too. Uh, if you ever take, you know, cuttings of uh, whenever you are pruning roses over the wintertime, you can uh, get those, you know, stuck down in some moist soil, and uh, and they'll usually root for you. So if you want to create some more roses, you can, you can do that by pro propagating. All right. So I wrote down some of my favorite varieties, and I've got this book here. This is the Weeks Roses Catalog, which is one of the biggest rose growers in the country. They're out of California, and they do their own hybridizing out there. It's a whole thing. Um, really cool. We get our Weeks Roses truck um, usually the first week of April. And it's got some of the more old school classic roses that you think of uh, with high petal counts, good fragrance, all that. And a really good company. I love them. They always come in with a good looking crop of um, roses. So I went through some that I really like and I just put some little deals in here to get me there quicker. And what's the first one? First one is my favorite by far yellow rose. This is called Henry Fonda. And, uh, you know, these are just pictures for y'all to see. But it's my personal favorite. I'm a yellow rose guy. They just do it for me. They usually smell fantastic, which Henry does. Um, but it's got the most crisp yellow I think I've ever seen in a rose. It's not soft. It doesn't fade to white like a lot of them do. It stays clear. It's got pretty dark foliage. Um, so the contrast between the dark foliage and the deep green foliage versus that just striking yellow beautiful crisp yellow is why henry fonda is my favorite yellow rose and we will have this one uh coming up soon if you like yellow roses you got to try out one of those you're gonna love it next up what did i put Oh, John F. Kennedy Rose. That's an old school classic. It is a hybrid tea that gets very large. I know this because my mother has one. I bought one for her years ago. And that thing is probably, it gets up to like eight feet tall every year. I cut it back down to like three foot tall at the end of the season, which I've already done for her. And it just, um, it's not black spot resistant. It's not all that disease resistant. I'll say that. But the blooms are huge. The smell is really fantastic. And it's a very crisp, just white. If you like true white, JFK is a really good rose for you. Next up is Peace. I put this one on here. This one's called Peace. It's kind of a bicolor pink. It's got, uh, you know, it's pink with kind of whitish, yellowish undertones. I mentioned Peace because it's kind of like, oh gosh, it's almost like rose growers go to it's like when they hybridize peace like they knew they found something and a lot of other roses have been hybridized off the peace rose we sell peace every year it's still one of our best sellers it's another hybrid tea actually it may be a yeah it's a hybrid tea um but it's been around since 1946 uh is whenever it was first um, hybridized and it's got a 40 to 45 petal count, very high, big bloom, good disease resistance, just an old school classic tried and true rose, uh, one that we sell a lot of. And then I did a bicolor one that I really like called Rio Samba right here. As you can see, y'all, there's all Man, sorts of roses. that one's gorgeous. Oh, Rio Samba is really, really pretty. It's like a sunrise, if you will. It's uh, uh, orange on the outside with kind of a, a little bit of reddish pinkish in there. But then it goes to this yellow on the interior with all those colors still sprinkled in. Um, it's a good rose. I got it coming in here soon as well. Um, it is, uh, yeah, if you like bicolored roses, that's something you ought to, you ought to try out. Rio Samba is a really, really pretty one. What did I do on this page? I did, oh, Sugar Moon. 
Sugar Moon is an excellent white, very crisp white rose, but what you don't usually get with white roses is a lot of perfume. They don't smell just like as good as most as a lot of roses do. The difference is is this one. Sugar Moon is fantastic. I mean, it is like it's like sugar. It's it's such a good smell. I can't even explain it to you. Um, so, and like I said, it's another very crisp white rose. Not the cleanest one on earth around here. But whenever you do get those things blooming, you will be amazed at the at the the smell of it for a white rose. How many? It's got a thirty petal count, so that's pretty good. Pretty high. What did I do on here? Okay, I did Twilight Zone over here, which is one of my personal favorite purples. I have this in my yard. It's a very old school rose. It's just got that classic double you know bloom to it it's just this deep deep purple over here you can barely even see it on the screen it's so purple but um i do know like i said i know this one well because i grow it at my house and it's got a really high petal count i think it's like what is it where'd it go twilight zone twilight zone it's got a yeah an over, over 40 petal count so you see a lot of petals packed into that kind of old school bloom and it's got a very good smell to it as well it's kind of old perfumey if you will uh but it's a good good purple and then one of the best roses uh, that's out there, and this is talking to some of the hybridizers even from California at Weeks Roses when they talk about them. Um, it's another yellow rose called Julia Child. That's this one right here. It consistently wins awards across the board. It's just an excellent rose. I've also got this one in my yard, um, in my little rose garden that I have. i got about six out there all together. I'm going to add to that here soon. Uh, but Julia Child is definitely one, if you like yellow roses, that needs to have a place in your landscape. Um, it's uh, it's a floribunda, so you get a lot of blooms that cover a very glossy green leaf plant. And it's just a very tried and true rose. Um, like I said, everyone should grow one of these because of how almost easy they are for an old school type rose so classic it's not as true yellow as henry fonda that i talked about earlier it's a little bit lighter and it fades a little bit quicker but i tell you when they first come out and they're just full show that's just it's not much not you know much of a better rose out there than old uh, julia child next one what did i do on here uh real quick question climber rose for some shade Yes, uh, Zephyrin Druin is the name of that, and I could probably I'll find that for you in just a second. It is shade more shade tolerant by their by the growers' trials that they've done. Um, not to say it would want to have a no sun environment like a deep shade environment. I would say try to avoid that, but. Zephyrin Druin, it's kind of hard to say, but uh, like I said, I'll show it to you. I think I can find it here in a second. Um, that is the one that I've heard that is the most shade tolerant of any other rose uh, that's a climber, and it's also mostly thornless. So uh, you kind of get the best of both with that if you have a little bit of shade. So try that one out. We do sell it here um, coming up soon in the spring. Also, folks, this is a good time to submit your questions, uh, yeah. just letting you know. Yeah, I've only got a couple left I'm doing here. I did this one. This one's called Iceberg. Once again, I've got white iceberg in my yard. This is classified by most rose growers as kind of the best white rose out there. I mean, it truly is. It blooms a lot. Not as high of a petal count. It's not single, but it's not a full, full, tight, like high petal bloomer. But it's very consistent. It's got very good white color that sticks around. And the plant is very disease resistant. I've had uh, I've, it's a vigorous plant too. I planted all my roses at the same time, and uh, the the white iceberg tends to really really grow quicker uh, than the other ones that I've got. So uh, kind of the goat when it comes to um, white roses. Uh, good old iceberg. We sell the full out of them. Goat <laughs> translates to greatest of all time. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. Don't when apologize. It comes it's beautiful. <laughs> All right, when it comes to red, when you think of roses, you think of red. I mean, almost everybody, that's where your brain goes. Beautiful red roses is a symbol of love. Um, and my personal favorite is called Showbiz. It is, out of all the reds out there, which there's tons of red roses, and they're all beautiful, don't get me wrong, Showbiz is an electric red. It's different. It's not a deep rose red. It's just not. It's bright. When the sun hits it in a certain at a certain time of the day, I'm serious, it's it's electric. It, it's a different kind of red. I don't know how to explain it, but it just knocks your socks off when you see it. Absolutely stunning rose. It's a floribunda, so you get a lot of flower power on top of that bush. And it's just something. I, I've got to get my hands on one of these. That might be my next purchase out here. I think I've got some of these coming. I'm not totally sure, but we should have showbiz coming because it is such a personal favorite of mine. When it comes to red, it's it's just beautiful, beautiful. It's just it's so different. And it just glows with red. So good one to use. 
And then, what did I put on here? Okay, this is this is the climbers. And I can find that one for you. But I mentioned while we're here, uh, I mentioned Blaze Improved. Blaze Improved is a very classic. If you know roses at all, you probably know Blaze Rose. It's a good, true red, double, good performer, rebloomer consistently. Um, and it tends to arch a little bit. So it'll get up. If you don't have it like trellised anything, it tends to want to go up and like kind of fall down a little bit. It's almost like a cascading type of rose, if you will. Um, so very common, very popular, a very good, true red rose. And then, where was it? You looking for the Zephyr one? I was looking for Zephyr, and yeah, because they had asked about it. But there was another one that I was going to talk about. Oh, Don Juan's another good, true double red. Joseph's oh, coat. Oh, pan up. Uh, oh, you good? Push me at? Oh, yeah. On the monitor. Joseph's here. coat, hence the name. It's got a lot of colors within that. My dad grows this in Texas. Um, it gets like 10 feet tall every year. It gets huge and it blooms a lot. It's a That's another popular one, Joseph's coat. And then Don Juan, like I just mentioned, is a good double uh, that we sell a lot of. Yeah, we get a lot of Joseph's coat in. Yeah, we and do. it's striking. Every time it just stands out from all the other roses. It does. But it's it's also really red. Because it's taller, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, okay, while I'm here, this is New Dawn. This is our best-selling climbing rose, probably by far. Um, it was, from what I've read, I believe, on my old rose book, um, was that I believe New Dawn was the first large flower climber to actually rebloom. So they've used this to hybridize other roses. Um, so it's a good, consistent rebloomer. It's a soft pink, so no, nothing real bright, flashy, or anything like that. But it's a good performer, grows very quickly. We have to prune the climbers out here a lot, just so you all know. We can't let them get as crazy as they want to get or we don't have enough room for them. So we keep them cut back. So if you come out here and you see a climbing rose that looks like it's tight and not climbing, it will. It's just we have to keep them in check because we don't have enough space. So, yeah, there's New Dawn. That's a really, really good rose. And then here we go. Here's Zephyrin. Uh, Zephyrin Druin. So that's, y'all see the, how to spell it. That's the one that can handle some shade. It's mostly thornless. Although I will say, not my favorite because it does not rebloom all that great here. Uh, I think that it can in certain environments, but for the most part, I only see Zephyrin Druin bloom like once a year. And it's a big one. Don't get me wrong. When they're in full show, it's pretty. But you just don't get the, the ever-blooming effect that you would with some of the other ones. So a uh, good one for the shade if you want it, but not as, as bloomy as, as, <laughs> as maybe you would want. So there you go. That's all I've got um, for some of my favorites anyway and some of just the best ones. Oh, there's one more bicolor one called Ketchup and Mustard. I wanted y'all to – I grow that one as well. Um, it's a red it, – hence the name Ketchup and Mustard. It's red atop with underneath their, the petals is like this striking yellow. So Ketchup and Mustard's a good name for it. It's a cool bicolor rose. It's become real popular as well. So uh, that one's a cool one to look out for, and we will have that one as well. Uh, okay, well, we've got another question here. Are there any special care recommendations for shrub roses? Uh, all the roses you're going to treat the same way, like I told you, when it comes to pruning and, and they're spraying and all that. There's Just because it's a different either hybrid tea or floribunda or shrub rose or whatever, no. Uh, there is no difference in what you're going to do. Shrub roses do naturally stay tighter. I know what you're talking about. There's a lot of limbs that are in there. So if you got one that's just got tons of stems, tons of sticks, and it hasn't been cleaned up ever, why don't we shorten that a little bit first? And then you're going to go in there and individually prune out some of those canes that are either getting old, uh, non-productive, or crossing with each other. But yes, treat them treat them the same way but i do recommend my mom grows shrub roses at her house and i shorten them for by about a third every year just to get them back uniform so they pop out uniform and it just you know give them a general cleanup from the interior but no you're going to treat them pretty much the exact same way uh Rhonda's asking i was gifted shimi roses i think is the is what she's saying uh is now a good time to plant them shimi yeah i don't know it could have been a, a typo um but show me oh could be know. could be either way it doesn't matter rose is a rose so uh yeah go ahead and plant them i mean i would plant a rose right now i don't see why not we're usually plenty moist here in the early spring uh to go ahead and get stuff planted and a lot of times the spring rains will more or less water it for you now i'm not saying just put in the dirt and let it be uh after you plant it you know soak it thoroughly around the root zone and then just keep an eye on it uh, another good practice y'all don't water your roses leaves at all okay just if you are going to have to water if you have a new planting um, water around that root zone and root zone only try to avoid, minimize splashing of water if you can and like i said do not just overhead spray the leaves all the time you're just creating more issues you're spreading those pathogens around so keep the water off the leaves but yes ma'am go ahead and get that thing planted it'll be just fine uh 
What about uh, pruning drift roses? Drift roses are the same as a shrub rose, like I was just talking about. They're just smaller type of roses. Uh, and drift is just a brand name, if you will, kind of like knockout. Um, and yeah, do it the same way. Get it done now. Get them back down tight where you want them and watch them leaf out in the spring. And I have to say, I love the smell of the drift roses. Some of them are nice. The sweet drift they, specifically. They pack a punch. They do. Yeah. When they're when the roses are in bloom out here, you can walk by them and you can tell <laughs> that they're in bloom. And it's still such a popular plant, as they should be. Like I said, y'all, it, that roses are not easy. Don't get me wrong. But they are sure worth a grow whenever you get those things blooming in the sunlight or in the morning when you got dew drops off of the flowers. There's just nothing better. And going out to smell them, picking them to bring them inside your home when they are in bloom. Deal with a little bit of that black spot have to be okay with that a little bit uh, deal with a little bit of insect damage once you get those blooms you're gonna just see how, how, how much fun they actually are to grow just with a little bit of maintenance here and there and how about uh, overwintering tea roses uh, this person is from Illinois from Illinois yeah like I don't know if they live there currently but like maybe in this climate Okay. I mean, Illinois is not too, too much different than us. I mean, it's a little bit. I guess it gets a little bit colder. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. I mean, they actually but I get think, negative. I mean, read your, uh, you know, when you buy roses or have them, make sure you look at their hardiness zone. But for the most part, roses are pretty hardy. Um, so I think you're fine um, up there. I don't know Illinois all that great, but I'd say... If I were going to worry about anything being touchy down here, um, then you mulch heavy. Uh, you could even cover up. You could overwinter the canes if you wanted to You know, keep the canes covered up through the wintertime with like a mulch or something. That might give you a protective little barrier to them, uh, and that might help you out a lot. Uh, if you're in Middle Tennessee, though, uh, you don't need to protect tea roses at all. They're totally plenty hardy here, so nothing, nothing added or extra is, is needed. Okay, and real quick, just um, what are some other growers that we get in here that people may not know of aside from Weeks and Encore? Some other growers that grow roses? Yeah. Uh, Monrovia is probably the biggest plant vendor we buy from here. You're probably familiar with Monrovia, the, the nice green pots. They've come out with some new roses. Uh, the Grace and Grit series is something they've just recently come out with over the past couple years. It's been a very disease-resistant rose. Um, it gets big. There's a bi-colored one. Now, there's a number of different colors out there now. We also um, get David Austin in, too. David right? Austin is an English rose grower, which are uh, similar in, in what all roses do, like I've just mentioned the whole thing, but their blooms are different. They're usually, like, cupped. Very big high petal counts um, and they're like tucked within their um, uh, Google it yeah just look up David Austin roses because they're pretty cool we do get a selection of David Austin's as well and they've got a huge bloom uh, that's very decorative as well uh, Sandy we do not ship we have local delivery in the middle Tennessee area uh, which and we do extend I believe into Kentucky a little bit uh, but we do not ship um, is copper fungicide as good as fungo nil? Um, it's not quite as stout, no, uh, but it kind of is. It's another one you can use just as well as the other one. It's probably the most common fungicide I think we would sell, actually. Uh, I mean, we sell it here all the time, but yes, it's effective against black spot and powdery mildew um, if you use it enough. Uh, like I said, usually two or three applications, or, you know, at least an application a month. Uh, you may even want us to step that up to two if we are into like warmer, wetter weather and you're starting to see some issues. But uh, yeah, we sell copper fungicide. It's out here and it, it, it is, um, you'll have success with it. And a last question here from Paula, are coffee grounds good for them? It doesn't hurt. I mean, you can composting with your coffee grounds first is probably the the way to go i would say get yourself a compost heap going and uh, throw all your coffee grounds in that first get that stirred up mixed up and let it sit for a little while and then add all that or organic matter to uh the individual roses and yes that would be a fine practice to use uh, but i wouldn't just take your grounds and put them right on the top of the dirt right next to the rose i'd probably let them compost with other stuff a little bit uh first <clears throat> All right. Well, I'm just going to surface here for a second, uh, letting folks know that uh, we've got some great topics coming up next week. A little bit lighter on next week's webinar load. I'm actually not going to be here towards the end of the week for a day or two. Um, uh, let me just pull this up real quick on our website. Uh, calendar says, okay, introduction to grafting. Austin, are you ready to do that one next week? Oh, gosh. Grafting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he did a really great fruit tree pruning video. Um, it, we're kind of getting out 
on the outskirts of pruning season now for for that kind of stuff. But tune in for that one. Uh, new plant varieties in 2021. That one's going to be awesome, March 10th. And then uh, the following week, we'll jump in with sensory gardens. going to be great. Companion planting. I'm doing that one. And container gardening across the seasons, which was delayed. But now we hit, we're getting annuals in. Austin's going to build us some great, uh, some great arrangements. So we're looking forward to that, too. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Austin, uh, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Guys, appreciate you watching. Um, trucks are rolling into the nursery like crazy. I mean, it's going to be nuts here before long. So uh, wait a little bit longer. Let us get some more plants in here, and y'all come out and see us because we're going to have anything you'd ever want. Appreciate y'all watching.